Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Accelerating innovation and globalization trends are disrupting global markets. We are a new generation asset management team that looks beyond traditional public markets to understand how innovation and disruption can benefit everyone. We are uniquely structured to solve the underweight to accelerating global innovation as we transition from Web 2.0 into Web 3.0. Our competitive advantage lies in the integration of our deep asset management and technology expertise under one aligned group to capitalize on the exponential opportunities of Web 3.0. The opportunities are for everyone. Invest different with Holon. Hello and welcome to XY Podcast. Today I have the privilege of interviewing Chris Mason. Chris is a unique kind of a guy and he comes across quite lackadaisical and you'll really enjoy listening to him. His, his, his story is is uh, is a good one and, and I have a feeling that he's got more in front of him than what he's got behind him. So, Chris Mason, welcome to the XY Podcast. Thanks for having me, Roxy. Pleasure to be here. That's all right. And look, as, as, as is tradition with XY Podcast, we want to get our listeners to learn a little bit about yourself. Um, and so, the big question is... Um, you know, why did you get into financial advice and where did you come from? A bit of your backstory, mate. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Roxy. Um, country boy, mate, like yourself. So I grew up uh, out in between Wellington and Mudgee, Central West. Um, came to boarding school at Review in year six. So, And I've been essentially in Sydney uh, ever since. How I got into the planning, I was always pretty sporty back in the school days and um, I had one of the, one of the greatest uh, – careers advisors ever which is a good story so I must tell it I was I remember sitting with her in uh, year 12 at review Chris what do you want to do and I said oh, I'm pretty sporty you know I think I'll be a PE teacher and she goes oh you know that's great and um and she goes just out of interest where do you want to live and I said oh, not sure no brainer that's where my mates are yeah that's where my school buddies are and she goes you know if you've got kids what do you want to do education wise and um and I said, oh, of course, boys, I'll go to review girls, you know, Loretto, one of the other private schools, absolute no-brainer. And she goes, well, you won't do that being a PE teacher. I'm just giving you the heads up right now. She said, maybe maybe if you love your sport, why don't you keep playing your sport and, and get into the into the business world? So I thought that was very sound advice. And then so I played a lot of cricket during my school days and ended up with one of my cricket coaches back in my school days said to me, oh, you know, you're a personal guy when you finish up, if you – yeah, if you want to have some time off before you study, why don't you come and work for me? And he happened to be a mortgage broker. Field, do you know well, Roxy? So anyway, first year out of school, I'm kind of his apprentice mortgage broker guy, trailing him around. And this is where I think I actually learned a lot of my soft skills probably that, that stood me in good stead moving forward. I was you know, 18, 18 and a half and I'm doing the mum and dad mortgage broking appointments at night and all the rest of it. He was a very good good broker but very good salesman as well. So I learned a lot of a lot of skills from him. Over the years, I did mortgage broking for a while, then ended up in a financial, holistic financial planning practice. And can I ask, where was that at, Chris? Uh, that was at, uh, so the mortgage broking firm was out at Chatswood, um, Advanced Residential Mortgages, and then- Shout out Advanced Residential Mortgages. <laughs> you, 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 you birthed the, the, the failed mortgage broker um, life insurance icon. Yeah, so then went across to Taylor Bowring, who was one of the original Shadforce firms, really good financial planning practice. Uh, Chris Taylor was the principal there at the time. Great guy. They were a holistic one-stop shop. And I was I set up the in-house mortgage business, swinging off the back of the seven or eight planners and property and everything else they did. And um, while I happened to be there, believe it or not, the guy that was running the in-house insurance happened to die. And the, the principal came to me and said, oh, Chris, you're doing all the debt work. Debt and insurance goes hand in hand. It's, you know... Why don't you have a crack at that? It's pretty easy. I'll get one of the good good old BDMs to come out and teach you and all the rest of it. So I started doing dual roles and then it got to the point where I had to choose one or the other and I thought, oh, this insurance stuff isn't bad. So that's how I ended up in the insurance stuff um, as a profession initially. So I kind of more fell into it, which I'm assuming a lot of people did in the insurance space. And um, the the teacher or the careers advisor, um, uh, can you remember the person's name? Uh, yeah, Mrs. Agnew. Mrs. Agnew. So if you're, if you're listening, Mrs. Agnew, we've got a very wide audience. Uh, so yeah. Chris still has quite a lot of PE teacher shorts that he, that he sports. Um, yeah, that's right. That are, that still a see. frustrated PE teacher. That's right. <laughs> so you've, uh, you've gone from mortgages. And now tell me the, um, you know, the, the, 
the life insurance person literally died and and you then took over those clients straight away. Is that, that right? Tell yes. me about how, how that then, um, you know, formed how you thought about um, this profession. Yeah, well, uh, I suppose that was a wake-up call seeing someone, you know, an empl- a staff member, fellow staff member die as one and then it, it validated the value of, it, of life insurance advice and then um, I got into it from there and, yeah, that's that's pretty well it. And um, when did you uh, – so at that stage you were working in a team? Yep. And um, were you were you running a team of, of life insurance writers or was it specifically yourself? And what, roughly, for everyone, what, what year was that? So that would have been around 2000, I think that would have been, yeah. Yep. Or well, a bit before, nine out. So I would have been there for three or four years and then essentially it got to the point where I'd brought in some referral sources, had some, fi- you know, some other finance brokers referring insurance to me and a couple of accounts and what have you. And it got to the point with the principle of, Taylor Bang, where I kind of said I want some equity or I'll go and do this Classic myself. Classic story. Yeah, and that uh, we couldn't come to agreeable terms. So then I started up Mason Insurance Consulting from there. Right, okay. There's a, there's a bit of a lesson there and, and, and that uh, that same conversation gets had over and over and over again and maybe towards the end of this we might I might ask that question of how you now on the other side of the fence, how you're bringing people through in your business, um, whether it be equity or, or, or whatnot. Yep. Um, so... At the st- at that time there, um, with the the life insurance uh, sort of landscape, um, did you look after? Did you did were you involved with lots of life insurance companies, or did you sort of have a sort of a narrow range? Yeah, I think uh, I would have been using yeah at least four or five of them. So it was a, it was a bro- it was an open architecture model. Yeah, essentially it was yeah, and I, I went. So one of the adv- one of the planners to give you a bit of backstory on that had just gone out before me, and he'd done the whole dealership. Thing and as you said, I'm I can be reasonably re- relaxed with decisions. I'm thinking, you know, insurance. I don't need a heap out of my dealer group. No, you know, not huge amounts of research. I need my risk researcher and all the rest of it for the ratings. So he'd just gone out to Lonsdale. And I thought oh, he's a very detailed guy. This guy, he's done his homework. If Lonsdale is good for him, I'll get yeah, I'll get authorised for that. This is when I went out as a one man band, just yeah, you know, operating out of a spare room at, in my apartment at the time. So I hooked up with Lonsdale, which ended up kind of framing up. The direction of the business in in some ways. Happy for me to go on. I've gone off on a bit of no, magic. no, no. It's um... Um, so Lonsdale was a dealer group that specialised in authorising accountants that wanted to do essentially self managed super fund advice work or just be authorised essentially. So I kind of ended up with Lonsdale. Lonsdale essentially came to me and said, "We've got all these accounting firms." We've authorised them all, but none of them are really going near the insurance stuff. So they ran the line with all their accounting firms saying, you've got this insurance is an important a compliance piece. Your clients need it. You've either got to do it yourself, which is a fair bit to it, or we've got a risk specialist, you know, Chris Mason. That's all he does. Why don't you start referring to him? And that's that's where I started dealing with, I suppose, B2B stuff with accounting firms, which is really what we've kind of expanded out on. And I'd like to drill down on that one because – Building relationships with accountants is, is is a story that just sort of goes round and round and round. And and uh, I liken the way in which you've dealt with accountants over the years to sort of cracking the Rosetta Stone. You somehow speak enough of their language that they're willing to to give you that that trust and and, and the business that flows. So maybe if you could give uh, you know our listeners a bit of an idea of how you how you cracked personally the accountant sort of mindset. And, and just some tips on how you did that. Yeah, look, I think with accountants, one thing for us, because we're, we're B2B, our services always had to be top shelf and in line with the accounting firm itself. So one thing, you know, I've always had the in the back of my head, if we, we only have to stuff up one client or do the wrong thing by a client or get sloppy service-wise, then we'll lose that whole account. So I suppose our service has always been of high end from a professional side of things, the reporting back to them, keeping them in the loop, you know, not overselling clients or any of that type of stuff, just having a more accounting structured approach, as I said, with feedback. And, yeah, I think all our advisors now as we've grown know that, you know, they don't have to do the wrong thing by one client or muck up the advice and that's you've got a whole relationship at stake. So I think that always set us up to be, you know, to have to be really rock solid with our service and, as I said, reporting and what have you back to the accounting firms. And I think accountants... Deep down, yeah, you know, they're managing risk. You know, whether it be business risk, yeah, you know, they're talking structures and everything else. You know, so whether it be buy sells or personal insurance, is very much kind of in their in their wheelhouse. I think that's a wonderful sort of statement. Um, the fact that they're managing risk because 
too many financial planners, I suppose, coming into the conversation with accountants with a bit of prejudice around they're looking backwards, they're not looking forwards. But the reality is, you're right, they're, they're managing risks and, and, and life insurance is another risk that can be hedged for a cost that the accountants mm. sort of control. So um, as far as the volume of, 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 of uh, accounting firms, where did you get to and how did you manage all of these these people whilst giving you know A-class feedback and, and continuity? How did you do that without sort of dropping the ball, as you, as you suggest? Yeah, well, we've just gradually built it up. Yeah, you know, we've been at it for... 20 odd years now and we'll continue to kind of scale over time so yeah and i think probably with a lot of businesses in the in the planning space you tend to do the b2b work with businesses that are more in line with your scale so as we were small it was a lot of one two three four partner accounting firms that were referring work as we've got bigger it's moved into the you know the picture partners and hlb man judds and stuff like that and we've we've always just ensured we've had the scale to do it and look accountants don't prefer a million people overnight either so generally with the relationships you've you've got time to build in them it takes time to get to get to know the you know relevant partners of the firm or the, or the client facing people and yet and you you know we've, we've always been able to manage that that's no problem and did you find that accountants like there's there's quite a broad spectrum of life insurance solutions um out there was there kind of uh, products or strategies that accountants were just completely blind to that almost every time you were referred you went oh here's another blind spot uh, look, I think for us, it's always, um, I don't know about blind spots, but it, it, a big part of our role once we engage an accounting firm or they speak to us about, you know, providing service to their clients is the internal education piece. So we spend a lot of time internally, uh, with the accountants and, and, and tailor the training to the, to the different areas. I'm a big believer in, in refer, you know, with any centers of influence or referral sources that your product has to be interrelated with theirs to a certain degree because it makes the referral so much more stickier. So with mortgage brokers like the business you're in, Roxy, that debt and insurance goes hand in hand. That It's a natural conversation to have. Accountants are always, if they're not dealing, you know, like you look at a picture partner's big SME client base, you know, biz, a heap of business advisory accountants. Now, if they're not raising buy, sell insurance and all the rest of it when they're talking about managing the risk of that business. In my view, they're not doing their job and I'm happy to tell them that. Like you can't be dealing with a $10 million practice with three partners. Yeah, yes, you might have the trust in place and everything else, but if you haven't tabled the fact that what are you going to do if one of those partners dies, how are you going to do the funding, that's that's going to be an issue. So um, so we, we do relevant training. So it might be the planners might be dealing with more personal insurance stuff, you know, what, what insurance are they losing when they're going down self-managed super funds? So we'll make our internal training very relevant to theirs. We'll then try and overlap that with some marketing to make sure their clients are well aware that this is an additional service offering for the clients. So I suppose our philosophy, Roxy, has always been whatever firm we're dealing with, we want to, we want to be a really strong reflection on their service offering to the point where a lot of our, um, Accounting partners or joint venture partners, it's white labeled. So, picture partners, insurance services is essentially us. So, it's HLB Man Judd. So, it's from their client's perspective, they're going, This is great. This is another kind of interrelated service that, that my firm can look after for me. And throughout, um, you know, from, from the genesis, you've always been a specialist. So, when you made the move uh, into life insurance, did you ever do any um, overall or holistic planning? sort of superannuation at all or have you always stayed um, very narrow focused? No, we've always been narrow focused and I'll always kind of maintain that, well, A, I was probably too stupid to be a planner and get my head around everything. I thought if I can learn the insurance stuff. We're still recording, Chris. (laughs) Um, But it also has been a real string to our boat because we're not competing with any of these firms in other areas. So I think for us, the fact that they can deal with us and there's no conflict, we're not doing anything else that they may be doing on the side as well because... You know, as you would know, most accounting firms have got a wealth arm. Um, they might have some type of mortgage broking set up in house or what have you. So it's always been, it's always helped us, I think. And um, when it comes to life insurance more broadly, I know that you um, uh, you get asked a lot of your opinion um, from the product providers and and, and building it out. And um, just generally, because yeah, there will be some 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 providers listening to this. Where do you think they're going right? In 2022, and where do you think they're still going wrong as far as what they're offering up? Uh, I think, um, I mean, look, insurers, I think, you know, it's been a bit of a, a vicious circle for a while with the whole pricing um, instability and all the rest of it. Um, and we're just seeing now, I think, you know, the, the birth of more flatter pricing, more sustainable pricing structures, which is 
I think, the way we need to go. I mean, commissions obviously now, if, you know, if, if I drill down into our practice, there's no money in, in the onboarding of a client. The money is in the recurring income. So, could I, can I just yep. stop you there? This, so, with, so what you're saying is now with, with, with Lyft having played out yep. um, and, and the, 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 the maximum level that you can take up front being 60%, you've just, that's now almost entirely your cost of goods to acquire the client. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. So by the time, yep, by the time we've underwritten a client, a new client and paid the advisor and everything else, it's, it's pretty well break even for us. Yeah. So I think the, the birth of the, of flatter premium structures, and we've got a few of our own tailored products that we've worked directly with the insurers to make sure, you know, we've kind of said we don't want the massive year one discounts and then deal with a client that's dealing with a 30% increase every year. So we've taken that upon ourselves and obviously we've got good scale. So we can have those conversations with the insurers. So I think that's, that's a better result for the client. Clients don't want the, you know, the kind of bill shock in year two, three, four, five. Um, they don't want to have to, you know, they don't want to run the risk of having to hopefully be re underwritten down the track when, when the market demands that they get a, you know, have to be re brokered somewhere else. And, and we, to be honest, don't want to do it as a, as a business either. We'd prefer to be able to set and forget the client at a, Product level and just make the appropriate adjustments to the client's level of cover as their needs so change. I, I, I'd normally like to sort of wait to the end to talk about that, but I'm, I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, so you've uh, you've uh, obviously you've identified the issue that we all we all know that, that as yep. you refer to it, the bill shock um, is, is no fun. And, and if 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 uh, the upfront commissions really is the cost of acquisition, you really want that client to have that policy for as long as as is practical and relevant. Um, have you? So you've been thinking about this for a while, and have you rolled it out, or is this something you're talking about at the moment? No, we've just rolled it out. Yeah, congratulations. So, yeah, can just, you mention who that's with, or is it confidential? With the insurer. Yeah, yeah. So we've we've done it with Zurich. We've done it. Yep, and we've also done some work with MetLife around product as well. Oh, well done, well done. And um, I suppose before we go on, there's probably a few people out there. Before you jump on the phone to both of those companies. Maybe, Chris, if you could just give us an idea of uh, the scale of the business you're in now and, and I suppose why those people have done that, just as a, a headline. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's, there's a fair bit of work went into it um, with both product providers in, in as much as they looked at our uh, book of business, they looked at our lapse rates. So to give you an overview of the book, it's about 100 million premium under management. We've got a better lapse rate than market and all the rest. So our whole kind of thinking around it was we don't really want to play in the pool of all this repricing which is linked to yeah, poorer performing um, distribution arms, whether that be group or aligned products or advisors, other advisors or what have you. We knew the experience of our book was was really good, strong, which we thought, you know, if we, if we have a one-on-one with Insurer, get the actuaries to crunch out all the numbers, we could get a, a much better longer-term flatter structure and, and the pricing based on so, so what you're saying is, if you're swimming in a, a pool, you don't want to be at the shallow end with the blue dye yes, around that's, you. That's exactly right. Yeah, you want to be at the other end where it's crisp yes. and and, and uh, works for everyone. Yeah, because we know that the outcome is better. It's it's a it's a much better book. Yeah, higher premiums, you know, staying on for longer, all the rest of it. So we wanted our clients to get the the benefits of that. Oh, very good. And um, so that's what you're doing. Uh, you know, the question I ask is, what what are the insurers doing well, and what are they doing poorly? And and you didn't really answer either of them. You just sort of said, what have we done to make things better? Yeah. Um, where do you still think that they they lack um, the the insurance uh, companies in dealing with advisors? Not necessarily the 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 the, the B two C stuff, which everyone knows about. But where do you think that they they could improve? Um, look, uh, my personal experience with insurance companies, Roxy, over the years has always been great. We've always had it, you know. We're in business with these guys. Um, we've always worked closely with them. Yeah, you know, they've been very good to us in a, in a number of ways as we've grown over the years and stuff as well. And and yeah, you know, my I'm a firm believer in business. Everyone's got to make a dollar, so they've got to yeah you know, they've got to do well. Their returns have not been great. They've been hammered. But so I think look, they're doing everything again. Their biggest issue at the moment is. Yeah, not a lot of distribution in the market. That's the <laughs> that's their biggest problem, and that's that's been a result of obviously the Royal Commission and other things have knocked that around. But that that will come back. Yeah, well, people are um, uh, people are indebting themselves at record levels. Um, so life insurance has never been uh, more greatly needed with mm. an aging population. Yeah, and I think just sorry on that previous question as well. I mean. Insurers get hammered a lot for discounting products and uns- you know, being unsustainable, but if they don't discount, they don't get the new business, which is 
driven by the advisors. So I think there's a bit of accountability on on both sides there. Yeah, and I think uh, from what you said, you you, you very much to, uh, approach them in a partnership kind of model. Um, that but you can do that with your scale. But you always did that, even when you didn't have scale. You always took a little bit of extra time dealing with, uh, you know, working with the life insurance companies, listening to them, whereas, um, you know, it's very easy to dismiss the life insurance BDM coming out, just another BDM. But uh, I know from, from memory that um, that you did take a lot of time. You really picked their brains and, and very much so you, you like to ingratiate yourself in that process. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, yeah, oh, look, without doubt, yeah. We've always seen them as partners. As I said, a, a, a lot of the insurers that, you know, the likes of Tal and AIA and Zurich have been really good to us as a business over the years. They've helped us in a lot of areas and, and yeah, we like to think it's a two-way street. Because we have a good, honest relationship with them and we work through stuff and that and that's the way it should be. There hasn't been enough of it, you know. It's always been, you know, advisors against insurers and that's not a healthy, in my view, largely anyway, that's not a healthy way to run your business. And, and yeah, we're understanding of the issues they've had as well. So maybe having a, a, a little bit of a think about the uh, the clients. So um, uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to know you personally, and um, for a while there, uh, your your eldest son, who's uh, now almost an adult, um, used to say, "I don't know what Dad does, but I think he just gives people money, um, a bag of money when they need it." <laughs> so um, on that, have you got a couple of sort of stories that? That stick with you from the cold face of clients of when when something's really worked or something that was really valuable that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I think insurance it's very easy to sell until yeah. There, I suppose the penny drops when you get a big claim. I had the the work colleague die, and then I actually had one of my first clients. So I still still remember him. They went out and saw him. he was very senior at um, Woolworths, so big job. Yeah, you know, had big debt. All the rest of it was a huge insurance policy. I think it was, and this was going back. This would be 18, 19 years. Six million dollars life cover, max IP. So he, he, this guy, got put through the ringer um, medically and super fit. Ran the house down. Was running twenty k's a day. All the rest of it. And then about four months later, it was he had asbestos cancer and died like two months after that. So for me, when you see a big claim, you see the impact on the family, you had young kids and all the rest of it. And for a guy that I would never have predicted to have a health, you know, a major health event like that. And that, that was, I suppose, that's what really validates what we do as insurance advisors without, without question. Yeah. So that, that was probably one that stuck in mind. And probably fortunately, that was really early on in the piece. And I think, you know, I've seen it internally with us. We have, we've got 20 plus brokers at the moment and some of them probably have never had a serious claim. So until they get that, I think it, that once they do get that and they and they see the impact on the family or the business or whatever it is, they'll, you know, that's when they'll get a true appreciation for the for the real value they're bringing as opposed to issuing a piece of paper that's saying it's going to do something if something goes wrong. Yeah, so you, you, you're completely correct. I mean, um the life insurance industry, industry isn't just selling a piece of actuarial instruments. It's 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 what happens when there's a claim, and and there are some claims um, that that sadly are easy easy to uh, validate um, with, mm. with a death certificate. But there are other claims that are more interpretive. Um, what is it that that you do or your business does on the claim side, um, and how would you recommend people who are maybe new into life insurance or they don't do it all the time? In fact. Um, the most recent survey is that only 12% um, of people now call themselves life insurance advisors, which is defined by sort of 40% or more of their revenue. So what is it that, that you do come claim time that, and a couple of tips that you could give people um, uh, to assist with claims? Look, I think, again, with claims and just going back to what we are talking about before, just work closely with the insurers. The insurers, you know, we've had... I think one claim over a long period of time with a with a you know a massive book not paid and that was just blatant non disclosure. <laughs> I won't go into those details, but the claims managers you know just work with them and that they'll we've found you know they'll go out of their way to help you. So that would be my best advice would be if you if you're a bit nervous about or haven't done much of it get get your BDM to bring the the head of claims out and have a chat to them. Make sure you've got their name and number. So if there's ever an issue, j- jump on the phone. That's yeah, I've, I've never been afraid to reach out in, in any area of business to get advice or help in any of those areas. And the insurers will bend over backwards with that. We all know they're very well uh, resourced internally. So just 
ask for help. And, and, I'll, and don't think that it's it's you against them at the event of a claim. Most of them will go out, of, you know, out of their way to make sure that claim's paid quickly and efficiently as soon as they've got the relevant information. So I certainly wouldn't have any hang-ups over whether they will or won't pay. It, 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 it's it's pretty clear cut in our game whether someone qualifies for a claim or doesn't. So that that would be my advice there. Mate. I had a great chat with um, Dan Blatch a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, his advice is, is is very similar, which is you know. Uh, get, get as close as you can to to their um, their assessor team. Get them out, train, learn. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, um, uh, be willing be willing to come to the table and do what it takes to get the, the claim done for the client. It is, as you say, it's not it's ludicrous to think that the people who are standing between you and a checker are, are, are the enemy. Yes, um, I think the sooner you work with them. Um, uh, the better. Now, when you, uh, because you are a life insurance a sort of specialist team, um, and you know, if I look at if I look at the the, the fascia, it's very much, you know, you had to learn everything. Um, how has that impacted uh, you guys the last couple of years? Given that you've probably never rolled a superannuation over or, or done any of those sorts of things, and did you find it frustrating, or is just another thing to to, to keep rolling the armor? Over? Uh, yeah, I think there's an element of frustration that, of course, when you, yeah, when when they want you to do study that, and I, and this puts it in perspective. Well, Roxy, as you know, I'm married to a cardiologist uh, doctor, and I remember coming home one night whinging that, um, yeah, you know, can you believe it? I've got to, I've got to do all this additional study of which I've never done a lot in the past. You know, I've got to do six or seven subjects, and she goes. Are you bloody kidding? I only deal with all I deal with now is hearts. You know how much study I had to do before I got to that in the general medicine. I had to get me across everything. So like it was like dry your eyes and get on with it. I thought, <laughs> geez, that's that's not a bad wake up call. So um, yeah, look, we've always I think you know, and I think this is where a lot of business went wrong. Royal Commission for us was okay. It was a line in the sand. We had to make changes. And for us, we accepted it and just got on with it. And I think, yeah, to be honest, yeah, and, and Senator Hume and stuff would love to hear this. Probably we're a better business for it. We didn't, we didn't sit there whinging, throwing stones, sitting in neutral. We thought, okay, there's a couple of areas that we're going to have to improve on, a couple of changes have to be made. And we just, just got on with it and we were surging. I like to say we're like the salmon. We've always been, we've been swimming against the stream the last four or five years. You've had distribution going backwards and we've been going forwards at a rapid rate of knots. So we haven't let, we've, we've got a pretty good, you know, it's a youngish, business as well so it was more just it is what it is let's just get on with it. let's control the controllables this has been a big mantra for us and i think that's the you know the industry as you would know has suffered massively from people just bitching and moaning for years about all this change some of which well a lot of which i think was probably warranted you know if i look at the industry now it's it, it's 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 a better better industry than it was probably prior to the changes that you know i don't necessarily agree with a heap of people having to get out because they can't get the study done but i think it will it will come through this and come come out the other side Look, I, I just got i just got a double thumbs up emoji from jane hume as you were talking <laughs> yeah. chris which is probably the more ple- one of the more pleasant text messages in canberra for the last two weeks yes um <laughs> so what um, you mentioned uh, you know when i asked for an example you um you, you mentioned a six million dollar but what's been the largest payout um that you've You've been involved in? Uh, not that much higher than that. I think we had about a nine million dollar individual case was the highest one we paid out. And um, I know that you, you're a big advocate of trauma uh, insurance and making sure that 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 um, that's working. Uh, is there any so with the future of trauma insurance and, and you know being married to a cardiologist, it's one of the big four four reasons why 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 trauma why trauma is there. But there's all these other facets of, of, of with mental health and whatnot, where do you see the the products moving towards? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, they've obviously just watered down income protection a bit. They've made that, you know, if you look at the detail, pretty difficult for self-employed people around justifying income or whatever. So I'm a massive trauma advocate and that's largely based on we pay out more in trauma claims than anything else by a fair way. So I'm seeing payouts all the time and and meaningful payouts you know people are getting decent chunks of money for serious illness as opposed to yeah you know, i think in the you know in the, in the modern day people get back on their feet pretty quickly as well you have something serious you're stented or it's keyhole and you know if you're getting through a 90 day wait on your income protection these days you're pretty crook but you know it's, it's just a balance and it's a case by case subject i think you know self-employed people or whatever you know to me trauma is probably the best way to go income protection is obviously important for you know the paye People and what have you, but it's always like as I said, case by case, and it's just balancing out the the right portfolio for the for the individuals or the business or whatever it is. 
So um, you've now got, uh, you mentioned earlier that you've, you've surrounded yourself with capable people. I think that's a common theme. Uh, you, you also mentioned you grew up in, in the country. Uh, did you go to a big school or was it small? And, and were you ducks of that school? And do I know the answer already? Yes, I was, correct. And how many people were in your form? <laughs> one other one other in my year at Spices Creek uh, Public School. Okay. So I just wanted to get that question on the record. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, you know, running a business and um, sort of getting to the scale you're at, uh, technology must play a part uh, you know, you were very firm on the reason why accountants dealt with you and, and partners dealt with you was that you gave good feedback and that you kept them involved. Um, maybe what have, have you used in order to give feedback, specifically for B2, B2B, because that's sort of your superpower? Yep. And where do you see that going? And what, what are you guys doing currently? So we're with uh, Salesforce at the moment is our CRM Um VPP is our back office, which you know very well. They help us uh, offshore, and and we've got a very good internal team. I mean, I think for us, there's there's been no magic wands on the on the IT stuff yet that's getting worked on um, through Bombora, the dealer group at the moment, and then just good people is is the key, and and using obviously resources like offshore and and what have you as well. But yeah, one of the keys to MBS doing well is is the, the the caliber of people we've got in there. And maybe take me through. Look, I, t- I wholeheartedly agree. Um, if you get people, then strategy, then execution, and cash comes. So, um, take me through how you've, you've you've come to build MBS and and the key people uh, in it. And and when when I Google um, MBS, I always get uh, all the articles come about, uh, which are fundamentally this inflection point around 2015, 16, where you made some decisions. So maybe take me through the team and how, you, how you've built them and maybe how you build your life insurance. Do you, do you have pods? Are they state-based? Or, or just give us a feel for how you're managing that because that's that's unique in our industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a big question, Roxy, but I'll try and break it down. So, yeah, I mean, MBS, it was myself initially, then I had a couple of guys work for me and I suppose back to – Right at the start of this chat, we we're talking about me not being able to get equity in in the firm I was with before. I never wanted to make that mistake. I was happy to be a smaller part of a bigger pie. So I had, I've always to this day continuing to lock in good people um, with equity because life insurance is a big equity based business as well. So I think if you, you know, if you if you're half clued up in life insurance and you don't want a piece of the underlying value, there's probably a bit of a issue there because that's where a lot of it a lot of the value sits but um so we've always had yeah had some good people really good people involved got i mean drew burden who you know is one of you know he's he's the kind of major shareholder with myself him and i are very different which has been a great part of the business he's the analytical detailed one so yeah we 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 work really well together on that if if you Um, listen carefully that's him laughing at the moment (laughs) by the way um and then, yeah, Chris McKenzie, Brent. So we had, we've had kind of a, a, an initial crew and we've built on that. So we brought in Carolyn Clark, who's a really strong general manager. Our CFO has just become an equity holder. So we, we've just added people. We've never been afraid to get, you know, pay people good money to get them in the business. So reinvestment's been a huge part of our success. You know, we weren't, I wasn't ripping big money out of the business for a long time. Everything was largely going back into it. And I think for me, that was one of the benefits of starting young was I didn't have, three kids at private school and all the income demands that I might have today. So it was great being able to start it, start it running pretty lean out of, as I said, out of a spare bedroom in a place and just build it from there. But adding good, good people is key. Oh, there's no way I'd be even close to where we are now if I didn't have some of those key people involved in the business. And, and take me through, um, you know, you, you, you're holding out on the, the, the bringing them in as equity holders. If I'm, if I'm starting with you and I'm aspirational and, um, how, how does that journey look for, for me? Is it a, is it a time-based thing? Is it a, a sort of a merit, or, or what's your process for for bringing people through? Yeah, look, we haven't got any. We've never had any real set formula. It's just I think as a business owner, mate, you know, you know when someone's getting is too invaluable. So we've always, if it doesn't matter whether they've been there a year or five years or what have you, if we need to have that conversation, we have it. Yeah. Um. Awesome. So the other facet that, that I, you know you mentioned about you. At the stage, you didn't have three kids in private. You've got, you got three kids now. How do you balance um, looking after a, a, a firm, looking after, you know, the acquisitions and, and also sort of your, your family and your health? What do you do to unwind? 
well, I do plenty to unwind if you if you speak to my business partners. I'm sure they would attest to. But I oh, I love sports. I still play touch football, still play golf, still play cricket. So I do a lot of that stuff. I mean, yeah, it's a big business, but it's I've got really good people in key areas. So really good general manager that that looks after all the staff. Um, my role, if anything, I think as we get bigger, in some ways gets easier because you've got good people doing a lot of the stuff that you used to that are, that are probably a lot better than I ever was at it. You know, I can focus on the on the you know the M and A part of the business or the joint, the new joint ventures coming up, which is an area that yeah, you know, I've always done a lot of and 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 uh, good at, and that's so it's it's great really. The business, uh, you know, the growth has been manageable growth. Still got a good you know work life balance, no problems there. So it's no dramas at all. And do you um when I think about uh, you know particularly you've been all all B two B. Um, does your business, uh, when you get direct clients in, it, uh, sorry, do you get direct clients in who get who come directly? Uh, yeah, we have plenty of direct clients. I think. And I need Drew here to answer a lot of these, a lot of these detailed questions. But I would say probably twenty percent of our okay. clients are direct, which would be you know, friends, family, referred from existing clients. Yeah, so we still do a lot of that. I mean, the, I suppose the core of the business has always been the B two B stuff. You know, um, but yeah, we we still do a lot of direct client work as well. And especially currently, I think at the moment, one thing that I'm well aware of that I speak to a lot of our Referrers about to kind of get them revved up to refer more clients is access to advice is hard. We know it's a big issue at the moment. No one's giving insurance advice. You know, the bank used to go to the bank and you'd get it or what have you. Now that doesn't exist. So, so what are they getting? Don't, don't, don't assume that people are getting can get access to a, a an insurance specialist to give them some advice on what they've got or what they haven't got. So, I'm, yeah, we we speak to our referrers a lot about that. It's not. You know, getting good advice, and I think planning is probably the same. is is not easy now. So I know, you know that's on the on the top of the government's list at the moment. Is how are they going to increase access to advice? So I think that's just a good point to make. With as I said, with all our first, don't think your clients have got this stuff covered off on elsewhere. They just it wouldn't be getting covered off on. So if I'm a if I'm a practitioner out there and and uh, I'm looking at, at life insurance, um, one of the the, the, the Big issues I've got is is around that profitability, um, especially initially. So, in your in your sort of estimate, um, and by the way, Drew isn't here. So, uh, but in your estimate, um, how long does it take you? Do you think to to uh, engage with personal advice of a client, take down their details, go through the right process, and, and develop um, uh, sort of a meaningful strategy? Uh, the insurance it can be pretty. It can be pretty quick. I mean, in our business, I suppose, where it's B two B, whether it be dealing with a mortgage broker, or a, a planner, we're, we're we're coming in with a fair bit of you know, you've got a fact find that's probably three quarters of the way done. You know a lot of the information, uh, so the insurance piece isn't massively complicated. You know, getting your head around how to advise the levels of cover and that type of stuff, and a lot of that's based on the client's risk appetite and what have you. You're really guiding them through that process. But our whole model and like what we're seeing with a lot of the other planning groups is all about, you know, how do you get more efficient? How do you get quicker? So for us, it's, it's what can we take away that the planners are doing that's just, you know, mundane work that's preventing them seeing the next client. So our advisors, I think, you know, one of the parts that they love about MBS is they're doing the pointy and stuff. They're doing the client stuff. They're doing the fact find. They're doing the strategy. And that's about it. It then gets handed off. You know, to the the administration team, which runs with the rest of it, and, and we're seeing a lot of that with our B two B planning groups that are all about Chris. This is why we don't want to do the insurance because we want Roxy, the financial planner, not to have a capacity of 150 clients a year of 250, and if he's doing any of this peripheral work, it's not going to work. And so it's all about having a pretty streamlined cut through system that gets from A to B pretty quickly. And that's what you know. I suppose that's the beauty of specialisation. We can have a full focus on making sure that the insurance piece is. Covered off, obviously comprehensively, compliance ticked off, and everything else. But making sure that the advisors aren't, you know, if you're if you're a risky doing your own SOAs and all that type of stuff, you're costing yourself, you know, a lot of time that you could be seeing the next client and getting someone else to do it. Absolutely, and um, I wanted to also, you know, you've gone into the operations and whatnot, but um, there is still a role for soft skills when you're into when you're interacting with the client, you know, regardless of how much information you get. And how does MBS sort of roll out their soft skills training or, or what advice would you give people who are listening to this, um, whether it be, you know, books or programs or, or, or what, 
what's your advice on how to learn the soft skills to, to master life insurance? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good, uh, that's a very good question. I, there's probably not enough of it around these days, but, um, like, I think where being B2B is a bit easier, probably for our advisors, because, you know, they're, they're coming from a trusted source. Normally, if their accountant has told them they need to get their insurance looked at or they're, they've just geared up on debt and what have you. Um, but internally for us, we have kind of two strands. We'll either have advisors coming through the business who will spend time with myself or Drew or um, one of our other business partners, Chris McKenzie. He's kind of head of advice, so he runs all the advisors. So he'll do work on that. They'll sit in on appointments and all the rest of it, see the way we yeah, we speak about the or advise the clients in the meetings and what have you. So, yeah, we still do plenty of work in that because it still is a – it's a relationship and, and trust business, albeit, as I said, in a B2B business, I think you're four steps ahead of everyone else because, you know, you've, the trust the trust element is already there when, you know, the accountant they've dealt with for 20 years says you need to speak to these guys to get your insurance sorted out. We've dealt with them for a long time. They're very good. So that, that certainly helps. And I, mu- I must ask, every time, you know, you hear about people entering into a, a referral arrangement, whether it be accountants or whatnot, do you find that you do the life insurance advice with that referring partner at all or early in the piece or is it a prerequisite for them to give you good or does it not matter? I'd really love to hear what your way to do their To do their own work. Yeah, because yeah, um, quite often people go, if you get theirs, then they'll understand it. But but I'm not sold on that. But you tell me. Yeah, so for, it'd be a combination with us. A lot Originally with the smaller accounting firms, what have you, yeah, we'd, we'd always do the – buy, sell and that type of stuff so they get to see what we do initially and you know, the, the business stuff generally rolls into the personal stuff anyway so we're doing that. Now it's probably, we just make sure we go out of our way and I think this is really important we're always on to our brokers about it. If you get a good result for a client, you make sure you articulate that back to that referring accountant or referring planner. So if that accountant's referred you a client paying 20 and the market rate's 13 and you save them a heap of money and add some policies that they may not have had or whatever. So we will, we're big on our, um, advisors and, and articulating that because I think, no, no, no. So, no. so, so if, you, like, that's almost like a, a bit of a health check on your life insurance. Is that part of your offering? Yep. Yep. Okay. And you, yeah. And that's kind of a, a part of, I suppose, adding value to Yeah. Those. So we've, we've done a few things like with a, with a couple of accounting firms where they've said to their clients, you know, we've got this new insurance division. We're doing compulsory insurance audits on all our clients. So our advisor is going to have a look at what you've got. It's all obligation free. He's going to make comment around the strength of the product, the pricing, anything else from you know that you may be missing or what have you. And that was they use their own language, our accountants audits, and that was you know that's been a massive success for us. So we'll. The, the way of extracting work is kind of the other art of the game with accountants constantly working with them to making sure you're getting access to enough clients to, to do the work with. And as I said, that's, that's training, that's marketing, that, that's putting stuff in newsletters, that's talking about the volatility of the market and the need for reviews and, yeah, you know, all the, all the, all the, you know, the importance of having trauma cover and things like that where you just keep chipping away at the, at the, at, at their client bases to make sure the work's coming out. Now, you mentioned um, that you've dealt with a lot of accountants, and I, I did know that, but, a, you know, a, a, a quick glance at your your website, there's an increasing trend, and maybe you can give us a bit of a feel for what you're doing now, where you're actually forming part of the financial planning offering of financial planning businesses, not just accounting firms. Yes. When, when did that start, and, and, and you know, how have you, how have you made that work without, I suppose, uh, you know, compromising the importance of the financial planet. Maybe take us through that that journey the last couple of years. Yeah, so I suppose that probably really start really started taking off for us. The accounting was obviously generally the kind of the mainstay, I suppose, or the main B two B partner. And then the Royal Commission brought in a bit of a flood of work for us around. So we had a uh, we took over or bought the JB Weir's insurance business off them. So they had a couple of internal brokers, pretty big book. Um, and a lot of advice groups post Royal Commission were found of, of kind of scope their offering to, okay, how are we going to really tidy up? Might have been a compliance play, could have been whatever where, okay, we want to focus on the wealth, but we're not going to do any of the peripheral stuff. It's, there's too much liability there. We're only kind of half doing it. You know, the brokers, are sweeping under, you know, the advisors, sorry, are sweeping under, yeah, they, they're doing bits and pieces of it, but they're not doing it properly and they actually don't want to do it. 
most advisors have got no, yeah, especially with the IP changes and premium volatility, they had a lot of clients coming back to them. So that that kind of initiated a heap of heap of flow, a big flow of work to us. We had a lot of big groups saying, okay, we've got this wealth business that we're going to keep building. That the full focus is around tech and everything else is going to be for the wealth. We've got yeah, an example, ten million dollars worth of insurance premium sitting over here. We're not really that active on it. You know, we don't want to get caught up in fees for no service. Can you guys just come in and provide that service for us? Take over the book or buy the book and, and we'll give you all our ongoing work. And in most cases, they'd mandate that, okay, we're no longer offering insurance advice. The insurance advice is referred on to MBS or, or what, it, you know, it could be a white label entity or whatever. So that, I think the specialization piece has certainly got bigger and bigger over the last four or five years because it was an easy it was an easy tidy tidy up for a lot of firms to go okay well doing bits and pieces of stuff and not doing it properly is not gonna it's not gonna cut the mustard now so how do we tidy up our different areas and that was one of the ones was we either do it properly or we don't do it and a lot of them have chosen not to on the insurance side especially the bigger wealth mob so we've got some big wealth groups that we're we're in business with and some some pretty big ones that we're we're in discussions with at the moment as well. So that that's a kind of big area for us. And look, it's, it's it's not it's 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 intelligent for them because, um, uh, you know, financial planning is as much about risk management as anything, especially if you're self licensed in particular, mm. uh, or any in fact all licenses. Some the, the risk is somewhere. Um, uh, the, the are you are you are, are you geographic or is it have you got um sort of where, where are you those wealth firms for instance that you've recently been involved with? Well, yeah, so obviously the bigger the firm, often in multiple states. So we've got offices in um, Sydney, big one in Melbourne, big one in Perth, small one in Brisbane. So we're pretty well got it fundamentally covered. Yeah. So and and our I suppose office expansion has just been in line with where we've had to be due to yeah I mentioned JB Weir earlier. They've obviously got clients in Melbourne, Perth, <laughs> Brisbane that they wanted service as part of the arrangement we came up with. So we had to make sure we had a presence there. So, so in 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 tandem with sort of the the partnership uh, model, and um, you've mentioned you you bought books of business, and there's lots of people um, sort of listening to this who, who have either or bought a business or not. Um, maybe give us an idea of. When you look to purchase a, a piece of business, you know what are you looking for, um, and and you know maybe have you got a preferred lender that you can talk about, or because like, we do get those questions just to uh, give us a feel for it. Yeah, so lending wise, Macquarie have always done our um, lending work, and if, if we're looking at acquisitions or often the acquisitions are part of a joint venture arrangement, it's always our ultimate kind of acquisition is. An acquisition that comes with ongoing distribution. So, the going concern. So, a lot of people buy books, right? And you're you're not doing that. We we want books and we want the consistent work. Yeah. So, I suppose like one of the more recent ones we did was Capital Partners in in WA. Serena West was um, one of the equity holders there. You know, really good insurance specialist. So, she's come across with us as an equity holder as part of the transaction. But that was. I think from memory, seven or eight million dollars worth of premium under management and a really strong wealth firm that will continue to refer. So you get the existing book, but then you've got, you know, I think we've got 15 odd planners that will then refer all their work to us moving forward. So you nearly get the best of both worlds. You get a book, but then you get a heap of ongoing work. And that's same with Jabby where we bought their book and they've been mandated to refer their insurance work to us moving forward. So that, that for us is, is nearly the ultimate. I mean, we'll still look at, Standalone books, if at, at the right price and what have you, but certainly, if you can get acquisitions that come with distribution, I think that's ideal. And do you engage the the lender early on, or is it sort of something you've done that many of them? It's it's it's, it's an understanding. Uh, oh no, we'd engage them pretty early on, yeah, and they'd they'd have a good look at it. So, yeah. Our CFO does all the work with Macquarie, so he'll sort that out. So, but yeah, definitely they're they're a hundred percent across what we're doing, given they've done a fair bit with us as well. So yeah, and yet again, a classic case if you've outsourced that job, Chris. Congratulations! Yeah, and, that's uh, right. it only cost you a bit of equity and not having to do with the numbers. So, yeah, so well done. It's uh, there's there's, there's uh, kids out there. Uh, this 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 is a, a very interesting sort of case study. It's quite transferable. Um, you surround yourself with. With people and empower them. Um, what, what kind of a leader would you describe yourself? What's your, what's your your leadership style? Yeah, uh, look, I, I'm a reasonably relaxed type of guy, but I, I Drew and I um, 
are also very competitive as well. So we're we're hungry. We want you know if if there's business out there to be done and we can progress the business, we'll we'll, we'll go hard at it. So I, yeah, you know, sometimes it's a bit of an issue for me where I think everyone thinks he's super relaxed, but you know I still want people. I get a kick out of seeing people progress themselves. I, I dislike people sitting in neutral for too long. I'm a big believer that if people are moving forward in their lives, they're going to be happy. So I want to help create that environment. And in, yeah, you get the naturally hungry people that are yeah, always looking to go. Yeah, One of my business partners, Chris McKenzie, he's been happy. Yeah, he's been hungry from day one. Yeah, If he does this this year, he wants to do this the next year. So you don't need to motivate guys like that. They're, they're on the go and they're they want to, yeah, want to progress, and other people sometimes just need some encouragement. So that's one of the roles that that I play in the business at the moment is trying to get, yeah, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter what area of the business you're in. I'm trying to, you know, push people to the to the next level because, as I said, I, I am a very, I've got a very relaxed demeanor, but I'm I'm also very competitive as well, and and I've got big ambitions for the business. So it's that's kind of. That's my management style. We've got our GM's pretty, you know, she keeps people between the lines. They've got a role to do. They've got to do it. Um, so we, yeah, we've got different, different styles, I suppose, internally, but that's, I think that's a good thing. But and, and, um, and it's interesting to say you've got a hundred million dollars of, of life insurance in your practice, which, uh, um, to the best of my knowledge is not institutionally owned or, or, or private equity, which is just 100% the employees. Correct, yeah. Yep. Um, and, you're still saying that you've you've got a lot of ambition. Where do you see the business in in, in sort of three to five years? Uh, so it, it, our kind of we just we've only come back last what late last week. We had two or three days off site to you know reset all the plans and budget. So we we want to get to f- four to five hundred million premium under management in the next three or four years, which is um, and obviously you know, we've got an EBIT number that we're targeting. As well, but I, I suppose we just sense there's a lot of opportunity, Roxy, at the moment. Like the market's in a bit of, uh, you know, distributions in upheaval a bit at the moment. A lot of players getting out of it, specialisation becoming more prominent. Yeah, we know we're in a really strong position at the moment. We've got a big scale business. We've got really good resources. We've got system and process. So we know we're in a position that if if a if a bank wants out of their insurance business, which we'll have, we can we can step up there and 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 do that type of stuff. So I think it's it's make hay while the sun shines a bit at the moment because I yeah you know, I believe it'll kind of calm down again probably in four or five years. But at the moment, there's a lot of opportunity around and we'll continue to push pretty hard at the moment when stuff comes up. And and, and I think you know the, the one good thing that we've had going for we get referred into a lot of stuff. You know we've we've done a good job with relationships and then you know the word gets around. You know Macquarie Bank have been great for us. They tip us into. Yeah, Jamie Melville at Macquarie is always on the phone to draw an eye saying, we've got this firm, you've got to speak to, we've got this firm. So, yeah, you, in, the, in this, I think in, in our industry and planning, if you do the right thing, the, the, you know, or mortgages or whatever it is, the word will get out there and there'll be plenty. And, and that's the most powerful of it. Yeah, referral you're going to get when, when you're getting tipped into those type of things. Well, I get a, I mean, I get a feel and I do, I, I do know that your, your business, that there's a, there's a culture of winning and there's a culture of success, right? And that's, it's it's almost that that winning and success is par in your in your business to steal a golf phrase of which you're mad for golf which uh, just just uh, but um, if I'm if I'm an XY uh, person um, listening to you um, it sounds like I've got some options uh, if I've got a uh, do you mean do, are you still taking uh, sort of Small to medium sized business referrals, or is it all now big big partnerships? Or oh, no, we'll, we'll look at. We're happy to look at anything. Yeah, whether it be a, a smaller boutique planning practice that wants to refer work out and strike a relationship, no problems. If it's a if it's a corporate or a bank or whatever, we'll we'll have that conversation as well. Yeah, because it's all. I mean, it's all good insurance work at the end of the day, and we you know, as long as we can keep. Keep up the internal resources, which we've had no problems to date. We'll certainly look at it. And, and what about what about talent? What about people employed to do the thing that you know? Sounds like the, the executive has got numerous opportunities in the business. How do you continually attract and retain uh, those mid-ranked people that that really drive the business? Uh, well, I mean, it's just one of those things that I think. Um, yeah, you know, often we will get good people with a transaction like a Serena West. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're buying a, a pretty good sized business over there, but you're getting the, the planner that comes with it and a couple of the support staff that just kind of fold into our administration team, which is great. So that's, 
you know, often and with JB Weir, they had two internal risk advisors that came across with us. So often you can pick up the resources with it. You know, we've got a pretty good REM structure for all our advisors that allows them, you know, really to kind of build a business within the business and keep building their so revenue just maybe, maybe stop you on that. So what that insinuates is that, that they, they get, they're getting a, a share, like an, a, a short-term incentive on retention, not just acquisition. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Correct. Yep. And the more we acquire, the more like they get the opportunity to manage, which their REM's, you know, pinned to that as well. So I suppose our, I think in any, any growing business, um, as exciting as it is at the top, it's pretty exciting for people at the bottom because there's a lot of growth. There's opportunity, you know, if you're an advisor to get a lot more work or manage more clients. If, yeah, if you're part of a, a growing back office administration team, there's positions popping up there all the time. So yeah, I think. I think everyone loves being part of a business that's that's on the move. So that, that's probably been one thing that's been easy enough for us, and we've had you know our staff retention and stuff is is very good. One of the things at XY is we wanted to celebrate the positive evolution of financial advice, and um, after nearly half a decade or even a decade of being beaten up, especially around life and life insurance, it's always it's it's quite refreshing to talk about uh, businesses on the up in life insurance, businesses that are confident about the future businesses that view the life insurance as, as business partners, um, which can only help uh, the clients and the general public. And I'd like to take the time, uh, Chris, to, to, to thank you and and, and, and uh, vicariously thank the team behind you that make uh, your day uh, easier than, than, than what otherwise it would be. Um, and for those listening, if you want to um, reach out or get in touch, there's, there'll be links There'll be links attached to this and, and obviously mbsinsurance.com.au is a great destination on behalf of XY. Thanks very much for your time, Chris, and um, maybe the next 20 years be as good as the last 20. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate.